and, and, and to a certain degree, sometimes discomfort. Amen. But I praise God for when he does that. Um, for the text says, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Right? And God has a way. Um, not always in a mean sort of way. God hasn't typically been mean to me. But God seems to know exactly what to say to get my attention. And I hope that you, you experience the same sort of thing that in your your time with God, that God is um, interacting with you in such a way that um, while he keeps you encouraged, and so, but he also gets your attention to sort of keep you on the path that he wants you to go on. And as young people in particular, what we often encourage you to realize is not only to hear um, the sounds of leadership and to hear the sounds of your parents, um, but really develop a keen ear for hearing God. And if you get really deep about it, develop a keen sense to know um, the feeling of God, right? To know when something just doesn't feel right. So that's not what God wants you to do. Be open to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Be open to that. In fact, the more you open yourself to God, the more that God um, avails himself to you and will direct you and will lead you, um, the more that you shut yourself off from God, there's a way, there's a possibility of grieving the Spirit. And all of a sudden, that annoying voice that you don't want to hear will become more and more quiet and more and more silent. The next thing you know, it's possible to have what the Bible calls your conscience seared with an hot iron. And so every word that we receive from God um, is dependent upon what we do with the last word we heard from God. Um, the Bible says it this way, um, that um, if you're faithful or few things, God makes you ruler over many. And the same happens when we um, receive the word of God to the extent that we receive what God has given us. God says, good, now I can trust you with more. Um, but to the extent that you're, you don't do that, you end up getting the same thing over and over again, right? It's sort of like in school, right? When you learn and you master one level, in an ideal world, they would keep making you do the same thing over and over again until you master it. Life's a little bit different now. Sometimes we just move you ahead, but God doesn't do that. He's not with that program yet. God makes sure that you master the one, and then you proceed to the next. Um, that's not necessarily God's means of perhaps just punishing you for not getting it the first time, but it's God saying that I'm not willing to put you into a place that you're not ready for yet. Right? It's God's, it's God's patience and his long suffering. And before God puts us somewhere prematurely, God will enable, will allow us to repeat sometimes the same steps over and over again until we get it. But aren't you glad in those moments when you finally get it? You know, when the, the light switch finally goes away, like, God, I finally get it. I get what you've been trying to say. I get what you've been trying to do in me. And now I'm willing to accept what you have uh, for me. You can find it. <laughs> I promise you, you can. You can find it. But sometimes, um, if you're lucky, you'll get tired of fighting. And you'll say, you know what, God, I see what you're trying to do. I'm just willing to surrender. Your way really is best. Right? Remember, there's a choice between God's way and your way. You'll realize that God's way really is best. We honor, we salute the Lord, certainly, um, for that. I want to, uh, it, it's to me, hopefully, uh, a, 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 a simple but hopefully impactful message by that. You know that's code word for pastors trying to be short, but I try not to make any promises so y'all don't get mad at me if I get longer. Um, our timing, the, the Will too might be timing me today, um, might be here. We could try to do this in 30 minutes. We'll see what the Lord says. <laughs> Amen. This is from John chapter 10, looking at verse 10. Um, by way of pausing, um, also, what we've been trying to do with our young men, um, Brother Vinny, we weren't here last week. I don't know if we were able to get the message to you. With our young men, we've had them actually going through the book of Luke. So reading the entire book of Luke, the book of Luke. Um, and we've also sent out the Dr. Constable's commentary, which is a really detailed um, detailed breakdown of the gospel of Luke. And so if you don't have that, please let me know. We will send that certainly to you via email. Um, I think Will Two said that's about 270-some pages of commentary, I believe it is, something like that. Um, but it's a very, very detailed breakdown of the Gospel of Luke, because what we want you to do is have as much information as possible. I am totally cognizant that the time may come that I might not be here, right? Life moves quickly. Life moves in interesting ways. And I want to make sure that you have as much information at your disposal as possible. I would send you all 66 books, but I thought that might scare you away. So for our young men, we're looking at Luke. Um, Sister Khadija has informed me that she's actually working her way through the book of John, which is where we're pausing on today. Um, and so for those that wish to join her, um, she's working her way through um, the book, the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John. 
And if you want the Dr. Constable's um, commentary for that, I can send you that as well. And meanwhile, me being the nerd that I am, I am, of course, reading both Luke and John with our young people, all right? And the commentaries for both. As if you want to join Pastor in that journey, let me know, and I will send you both Luke and John <laughs> so that you can have that as well. We grow to the extent that we're willing and we're willing to learn. I'm convinced of that, that, that leadership is all about learning, right? You cannot take people places if you're not willing to grow and to develop and to learn. And I believe that we are a church full of leaders. Is that not right? Right? We, we train and we equip people um, to lead others. John chapter 10, verse 10, it says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I'm emphasizing the second part. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it. What does your Bible say? More, More abundantly. More abundantly. Shall we pause and pray? Father, in Jesus' name, you are the author. You are the finisher of our faith. Everything that we do, oh God, is because of your strength and your power um, that's motivating it, that's energizing it. Is the Lord, we utterly depend upon you, not only that you might equip us, but God, that you might actually give us illustration, give us insight, give us revelation, give us what you need us to know. Help us to hear your passion. Help us to be attuned to your heart. God, cause our ears to be close to your mouth. We might be able to hear from you so many distracting things, and yet, God, we want to hear from you clearly. We pray, God, for signal, oh God, that we'll be stronger and counteract any noise, oh God, that might be trying to rise up in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. We give you thanks and glory. Amen. Amen. And so you know how these things start, right? Here I am with my normal happy life. With my normal happy life. And after last week and discipleship and um, the Lord's resources and all those sort of things, um, I, I gave myself the prayer again, as we, as we all probably have done throughout the course this week, and I'm, I'm talking to the Lord. I think I was driving in my car, you know, life going okay. And then all of a sudden in my mind, my mind starts, you know, talking to me. And, and a lot of times, don't laugh at me. I think my prayers, I, I don't pay attention, but I think my prayers, you start something like, <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> I think they start that way. I, I Anybody else is first time that way? You don't have to raise your hand. Don't, don't let me feel my by myself. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Right. It, I, I think that sometimes I enter into prayer exasperated. I didn't realize that. Sometimes I, I enter into prayer from a state of just so much stuff. You know what it is? I, I read so much stuff and I'm aware of so much stuff that when I enter into prayer, I have a tendency of bringing it like we're supposed to, right? So I bring that stuff with me. And I, and every time I look at Facebook, I just stop looking at Facebook. Everybody seems to be dying. Every time I turn around, like, death is already there. There's families that are bereaved on the one hand. Then I'm looking at how divided our world is, how divided our country is, and God forbid how divided the church is, right? And then I look at, you know, the disparity between sometimes what we want to do and what we're doing. And stuff. it's like, and it's, yes, and now you're there too, right? It's like, but I've been wondering, I've been pondering, I've been dealing with this whole notion of friendship with God. I really have this whole notion of friendship with God, of friendship with God. Because every time somebody says things like seven steps to get your prayers for, for, to God answered, it just irks me in an annoying way. Uh, because I don't think that the goal of prayer is for us to somehow trick God into doing what we want. But I do believe, as we've taught from the beginning, that prayer is really communication with God. There's really interaction with God. That it's really about this whole thing of developing this friendship. And I don't mean that in a light and trite way. I mean that in a very, very real way. That when this, when the uh, when the hymnologist pins the word "what a friend we have in Jesus," I think he really meant what he said by that. I think that he really wanted us to have uh, this deep re relationship and friendship with the Lord. And when Moses called the friend of God, I think that there's meaning behind that. And yet, if I look at our communication patterns as relates to God, oftentimes our conversations aren't the most friendly. They're not the kinds we would really want from a friend. I, I'm telling you that I, I just didn't want to be that friend that every time they call you, they always call with a complaint. <laughs> and yet, when I looked at myself, I try to be a good pastor, right? I try to be a good leader. And part of that is this, this job of intercession. 
right? And so we bring the burdens of the people. And y'all, you that watch me pray in altar call, you know that I have this tendency to hold somebody's hand and start feeling everything they're going through. As I have this, this, this thing, right, of, of, of going into my prayers and not only my own complaint, but oftentimes feeling the burden of people. And it's like, uh, right? So burn, that's like, Lord, this is very interesting. Now, I don't want to be that person. All, all of our time together can't just be a catalog of what's going wrong in the world. All of it just can't be. And I know we do an obligatory praise thing. We talk so, right? The interest is giving things. It's going to praise, right? We're thanks for him. We bless his name. And then after we go, uh, complaint number one, complaint number two, complaint number three. And, and, and it has challenged me in terms of depth of relation and how much that as if we were telling God something that he didn't already know. How can we better utilize the limited time? Well, y'all got un- unlimited time, right? But for most of us, we think of it to a certain extent as this limited time that I get to give uninterrupted time to God. Is there anybody else's testimony that you know? You've got work, you've got school, you've got things of that nature. And so the uninterrupted time is not perhaps as long as you want it to be. But if we want to have uninterrupted time with God, it needs to be quality time. And how do I maximize that quality time with God? You have friendships like that, right? You got to be really careful with your friendships, right? Because uh, especially when you're on the other side of it, you, you see it more. But you ever have friends that are really busy? Everybody got friends that are busy? Are your friends busy or just mine? My friends are busy, right? And they're so busy, I get it. They don't have time to usually talk, you know. I'm not much of a telephone person, so that gets them off the hook. But I'm kind of a texter, right? I'm a, a texter and a, a, a Facebook messenger type person, right? And so it's called, you know, like, hey, how are you? And how are things going? You know, and, and I expect to be kept up to date. And so if something happens that's really big, I didn't hear about, I do kind of feel kind of left out, right? That sort of thing, right? And so I, 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 I'm big on that. But I recognize that it's possible, don't laugh, for me to like write, hey, how are you to somebody? And then look three days later. And the last line is, hey, how are you? I don't know. Let it go. Oh, they busy. Right? They busy. And then, you know, I'll write back and be like, you know, sometimes I won't like a stalker. So, you know, maybe like a week later. Hey, just checking in. And I'm like, okay, all right. They busy. Everybody says they're busy. They still update their Facebook status, but they're busy, right? <laughs> we don't got time to pray, but we update our Facebook status. But, but they're busy. I get it. All right? And then all of a sudden, I get this message back that says, hey. And I'm like, wow. Hey. How are you? Where have you been? Oh, man. Things have been really difficult. But, well, what happened? You think I could borrow some? <laughs> Life has this crazy way of making it so that the very people you don't have time for when you're busy are the very people that you need when suddenly you have an issue. And then all of a sudden, there's this expectation that you will just rise up and do the miraculous. Well, we haven't talked at all. And you think that you have persuasive power. And I'm like, I said, hey, you like five weeks ago. You understand what I'm saying? Talking about prayer, though, right? And I think that the difficulty is that when we talk about how to get our prayers answered, how to get God to hear us, and all that kind of stuff, I think that we are skipping over friendship and relationship. The reason why God hears me when I pray is because he knows who I am. I spend the time with him, and we talk, and we interact, and he tells me funny stuff to tell to y'all, that I come back and report to y'all. But I got to be really careful with that, you know? There's two things that I got to be careful with. One thing I have to be careful with, one thing I want to share with you. So as I am, right, I'm, like, I'm driving along, I think it was. We was riding in the, in the train. One of the two, all those I'm moving. And I'm there, and I'm in my, I'm praying. It's probably safe for me to be in the train praying. Because y'all know me, I be closing my eyes and forgetting I'm driving. And so, <laughs> don't let the insurance man see this. But as I'm, I'm going, I'm, I'm like, and I'm, I'm trying to give a good prayer that helps all that. I'm trying to give a good prayer. I'm like, mm, I don't want to, I don't want to complain for it. God help me not to blame, right? And the problem is that every time I thank him, you know how every cloud has a silver lining? Mind me, sometimes every silver lining has a cloud. Right? 
And so I'm like, Lord, I thank you for continuing to get into school. And you know what happens? That clock goes, Lord, all this money. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm, like, I'm trying to thank him. Like, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for giving us a home. But Lord, you know, I wanted to pull the back. <laughs> <laughs> it's very easy for everything that you think to have like some sort of but I'm also what is it? This ain't going right. This ain't right. And then God, why don't we start this again? Why don't you start this conversation? <laughs> and I'll follow you. And he said something really funny. He said, So William, what are you excited about today? And I'll ask you the same question. What are you excited about today? And I didn't like that question very much at all. I'm like, well, I'm excited about, hmm, I'm excited about, um, well, could you just go to school? Oh, that's very covered. That didn't we got, yeah. yeah. I'll be waiting for that to get paid off, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm excited about, whoops. I don't think I'm really excited about anything. Y'all supposed to be a fun message, didn't you? <laughs> like, yes, we escaped. Like, so abundantly. And then here we come to your row. What excites you? What are you excited about today? And I told you last week about how the money is his, the resources is, the life is his. And what, and the reason why I didn't like the question is because what an insult it is to God that's giving me life, right? I'm like <gasps> breathing right now because it's his breath. He's like, what's exciting about today? What are you excited about? And I'm like, I have no excitement about this life that God has given me. I was doing things, just going through the motions of life. I got a job I've got to do. I've got bills I've got to pay. Going through the motions of life. But what an insult it is to God that we live life without excitement. Do you really think that when God designed your life, he really designed it for you just to wake up like a zombie, spend 8 to 10, 12 hours doing what you do, go to sleep, and dread getting up the next morning to do the exact same thing? Give you transparency in my life, I will have a good Saturday. I have an okay Sunday. By about the middle of Sunday evening, it hits me. Tomorrow is Monday. Is that how we were designed to live life? Is that really what God wants from us? Talk about making disciples, right? Because we're going to make disciples. There needs to be something about your life that makes people say, wow, that's absolutely different. But if you're doing the whole zombie move that everybody else is doing, what is it about this life in Christ that makes anybody want to be a Christian in the first place? Right? It is purposeful life that gives excitement, right? It's purposeful life that gives drive, that gives motivation. But when you're so focused on the mundane, that you're distracted from your purpose, nothing becomes exciting. Do you think that it's possible that when a person is around you that's excited, that you can tell they're excited? You think you know that? You think you can you can detect people that are excited about life? You think you can detect people that are not excited about life? Which one are you? And so Jesus says, the enemy comes, the thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And I wonder how much of our life experience, how much of our joy, how much of our, all those things that God has for us as the enemy successfully and sneakily, it does not say the robber in this case, if you steal tithes, you're a robber, right? They do it right in front of God's face. But the, the, the thief, the one that steals, kills, and destroys from you, he's a thief. Don't you the robber and a thief? A robber comes right up to you and says, give me your stuff. A thief waits until you're not home. <laughs> right? Sneaks in and burglarizes, right? The thief comes not but to steal, kill, and to destroy. How much stuff has the enemy come and sneakily tried to take away from us? And yet, what is it that God's really trying to do? What is it? When we talk about life, 
because we recognize that life comes with a price. He died that we might live. Is this the life that Christ died for? I really ask, is this the life that Christ died for me to live? Jesus just defines it in text. You can read behind me and make sure I'm not misleading you. He says, but I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Life in overflow. Life, and I'm not talking about overflow of just stuff. We've got to really, really be careful with this because you can be overflowing in stuff and still miserable. Right? Because here's what happens. I'll tell you funny stories. Don't laugh at me. So one day I'm walking around my house and I'm like, what's wrong with this house? Why do I feel connected to stuff? So one day, y'all remember, well, when I started actually like, touching my first house, I believe it was really there. <laughs> I like, no, because I, I can feel very disconnected from stuff. I don't know why. It's my problem, right? So, just, I'm like, it's, maybe it's just really here, right? It's like, so I'm like trying to connect. So I can like, feel like I'm a part of so my home. So my house can feel like home, which is a very real thing for me. Right? So I'm trying to make my house feel like, what is the issue? I'm like, I know it is. When we had the apartment. We had a bunny rabbit. I need a pet. I need a pet. <laughs> and so my wife is away at work. One day I get this like exciting uh, thought, I'm going to go. And I had I didn't spend real money, I spent credit card money. No, no, no. I mean like 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 not real credit card money, not like debt money. I mean like the money they give you for spending money. So when I spend a certain amount of money, I get cash back. Because I spent that money. I didn't think my wife would mind that, right? Because that's not real money. That's money they gave me. That's like money they gave to me, like rewards money. So I went to the store and I went, I, I looked it up online. On, um, on on Walmart, try to find. And I found out that the Parksburg one didn't have the extra. That I'm always like near Kenneth Square or something like that. Go to that Walmart. They go get myself. Um, don't look surprised. Like, they go get myself the fish tank. Right. I, I said I'll get this fish tank. And um, so I got a fish tank. I couldn't just get a fish tank. I need to get the right stand for the fish tank. Right. So I'm there. And I need to make sure I have plants for the fish. I want to have like little duckies and I might have little babies. I need to have the plants for fish. I need to get enough ground, the ground to get the right color. Then I need to get the right stuff for the swim inch. I need to get the right food and stuff. And then I had to get the right fish. And I got guppies the first thing. Sometimes they died. Then I had to get tetras. And then as I came in issues, I kept buying fish and all this kind of stuff. Right? And every time I got the fish tank right where I thought I wanted it, I had to go back out to Walmart or PetSmart. To go buy some more again. Because whatever I had in there just never seemed to be enough. So after I got myself um, guppies and I had got myself some black tetras, but they died off because the water hadn't cycled through enough. And I got myself some neon tetras and they had died. It hadn't, you have to let the tank sit for a while, go through the nitrogen cycle and all that kind of stuff. Then we got some more. And then, if I'm not careful, I'll sit there in this tank that's now full of fish and think, if only I had. One of those stick like fish. That are, you know, I know it's semi aggressive, but kind of interesting to look at. What I'm telling you is that nothing ever satisfies us. You can always find something else. Like, I walk through my own house and it's like, wow, I wish I had gotten that. Like, what's that stuff called? Not the crown molding stuff, the stuff that goes on the walls. Not just chair rail and the kind, the, the stuff that makes the little square boxes things. You know, square box thing? Oh, yeah. yeah, those things. I wish I had. Some of that. And I want big square boxes of that thing, right? That's why. So we'll never be satisfied with stuff. And so you can't depend on stuff to excite you. You hear what I'm saying? You can't depend on stuff to excite you. And then if you get enough people, you think that hang around, people make people just start getting nerves after a while. It's like we just leave me alone. Not you then. Oh, <laughs> See, I had to walk away that way you do it and you know, like think I was talking about you. Nah. Right? And that starts getting in nervous. That starts bothering you. And you find it's not about being the right social, not about being the right degree of popular. Because popularity won't do it either. So I, I, I'm asking the question about what is the exciting life, right? Because some people tell you that it's having all the money and buying all the finest stuff and having the nicest houses and having all the all these things. Give you the exciting life, and you realize that that's not the exciting life. This is about well, maybe it's having the right stuff, plus having like the people that you want in your life, etc., and being the right crowd. People all think you're wonderful and great. And you realize that that's not it, right? 
Because nothing external will give you this excitement. That doesn't do it. There has to be something deeper and more meaningful that gives our lives value. And I've heard this text preached so much, unfortunately, in the next, last 10 or 20 years from the standpoint of, yes, God wants you have abundant life, so therefore you need to have this kind of house and this kind of car. But that's not abundant life. It's about what, 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 what enables you to wake up in the morning and not pull the sheets back over your head? Is there something that's driving you to say, you know what, this is the day that the Lord has made, I'm going to rejoice and be glad in, and be productive in it and be excited to begin this day. Now ask yourself, don't answer to me, but ask yourself, don't answer to me, when was the last time you were excited about living your life? Absolutely excited about the fact that wow, this is another day. How can I? How can I? I can't wait to get this day started. Or was it? Uh, it's another day. God just helped me to get through this day. If every day is a gift, how grateful are you for the gift of life that God has given? And if I wasn't grateful for yesterday and grateful for the day before that, then how dare I complain when things don't line up where I want them to today? A lot of times we talk about gratitude and giving thanks with a grateful heart and all those sort of things, but those of us that know God can sometimes be the most ungrateful people. Right? Have you ever, and for those of us that have children, have you ever created this whole exciting event for your children? You had this thing you thought was so exciting that you thought they would really like and really enjoy. And you said, like, hey, guess what, kids? They're like, what? Today we're going to do this. They're like, huh. Oh. And that moment, because of their lack of excitement, it made all that plan just feel like a waste. I wonder how many times God has planned stuff that he expected us to go wow about. They were just like, ah. Jesus. And then you know the next day you just stop planning stuff. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not you, Khadija. <laughs> right? But it's like, it, it's, God, how do I tap into this excitement that you want me to have? And what does it mean when I haven't tapped into it? And what does it mean when I begin life every day with drudgery? And what does it mean when I refuse to allow myself to get out of this mindset, because it really is a mindset, this mindset that steals away the joy that I'm supposed to have? Because that's what I want to challenge you with today, because that's what you challenged me with. Now, I, I'm sorry, because now, now you don't need to walk away with three steps to have a joy-filled life. No, it doesn't work that way. And this is what prayer does, right? I'm sorry, I'm sorry I'm talking about prayer. And you, you think about prayer in one way, and yet God has this other way. You ever notice that when you really start praying to God, God gets really introspective with you. This is about life shifting, right? This is about how you live. This is about your ways. We talk about repenting, about our ways. Who knew God would be upset about the way that I woke up in the morning? Right? We spoke so much about, oh, God, I'm so grateful to you. God, you're a good God. And we're like, oh, God, another day do I have to do this? There's a disconnect. This is why, I, this is why we have such difficulty transitioning from Sundays to Mondays. There's this terrible disconnect between what we say on Sunday mornings and how we live throughout the course of the week. And this ain't about cussing somebody out and slapping people, you know, and, 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 and scratching people's cars that you don't like. It's not, it's not about this. This is, it, it started before you even got out to bed. Before you even got out to bed. How was your perspective? That's why it's so important to have the, the psalmist says, early in the morning will I rise up and seek thee. 
I think there's a there's a there's, there's an importance behind that. Because I don't want to start this day on the wrong note already. Already negative. God, help me to see. God, what is it that you want me to do today? What set some goals for your day that you're excited to achieve? You know, today's going to be the day um, that I'm going to actually meet somebody and tell them, I'm going to tell everybody I know. I don't know. It might be a long time, might be a short one, but I'm going to make sure everybody I meet today hears about what the Lord has done for me. I'm going to give my testimony to somebody that get something to be excited about. Find a way to fulfill your purpose every day of your life. Because I don't want to ever tell you that you've wasted a day or wasted time, but you know already that many times it's very easy to waste a day and to waste your time. What's the sense of it? And, and I mean, we could just do the whole church thing, right? And we could give a nice little sermonic whatever, and then we could go home. But what does that count if at the end of the day we, we all go home tomorrow? Or we go home. I might go home tomorrow. We all go home, and then tomorrow wake up and start wasting days all over Again, if faith, if, if reality is contingent upon faith and expectation, what does it mean when we begin our days with so little faith and so little expectation? Now, let's turn that on its head. Let's say that tomorrow, all this week, we determine that we're going to start every day with excitement, that we're not going to allow ourselves to get up and go, oh, another day, but we're going to be. Even before we went to bed at night, we're going to find a reason to be excited about waking up tomorrow. Do you think your day would be different? Do you think you would pray differently? How would it change the way that you prayed if you prayed from the perspective of being excited versus the perspective of being miserable? Is God moved and impressed by your misery? Or is God moved by your faith? How much of our faith has been stolen from us because of our lack of excitement and joy? How much of your strength has been stolen from you because of your lack of excitement? The joy of the Lord is, and yet how much of our strength has been just zapped away from us because we don't live life with joy. We live life just going through the motions. I believe that we can make a choice and a decision today with the help of God to never live another day without excitement. Right. This is not the altar call that says if you come today and we come to the altar, we're going to not, your God's going to be a thousand dollars this week. That's this is about more. This is more important than a thousand dollars because a thousand dollars you can get and still be miserable. This is about a decision, a decision point in your life where you now say, you know, I'm going to live every day with excitement because I can't afford. I'm getting old. I'm getting like midlife crisis too. I can't afford to, to, to waste days out of my life. I can't afford to have any more days. I'm going to call where I look at the end of my day and say, what did I waste my day on? I don't got but so many. And so I want every day to be productive. I want every day to give God glory. I want God to be honored with every single day that I live so that when I do one day have to give an account for these days of my life, I want to ensure that the life that I live was maximized for the kingdom. Does that make sense to anybody? I want to be able to pray different. I don't want to be praying miserable, sad prayers. I, I, I've given you this example before, but it's a very relevant one. I, I think that one day it'll catch on. Somebody will really, really get it. Um, but there are two people that can approach the mountain, right? One person, by way of their expectation says, Lord, give me strength to climb this mountain. And God does what? Gives them strength to climb the mountain. Another person encounters the exact same mountain and says, God, I believe by faith that we can move this mountain. And what does God do? God moves the mountain. What? Not just according to your faith, but according to your expectation. It says, if you will not doubt his heart, he shall have whatsoever he saith. God is interested in what you have to say. The determining point between the two is what do they say about the situation? Right? God does not necessarily, he's not learning anything from you when you describe your problem. 
What God wants to hear is what is your creative solution to it? Does that make sense to anybody? And according to your faith, you can either speak or confront the mountain. Lord, I speak that I will have strength to climb this mountain. Or you, the same person, can say, Lord, I speak that this mountain shall move. Where is your expectation level? When you encounter your day, where is your expectation level? Do you expect God to show up in your day? Do you expect God to show up in your encounters? Do you expect to see God reveal in what you're doing throughout the course of the day? I will say that God is exciting. Exciting. I get yourself in trouble. <laughs> no, he ain't excited. Right. But the more you get to know him, the more you get excited because God starts doing this weird, unpredictable stuff, right? And so part of the reason why we're not excited because we don't really expect God to take counter God on a daily basis. Because we live a whole lot of our life with God not in the forefront, but in the background of our minds. Right? And if I'm really honest, we do a whole lot of praying with God in the background. God teaches how to pray correctly. And it's not about the right words or the length of prayer and all that. It's about proper perspective in prayer. Because half the prayers we could do, God wants to be nowhere near around for us to pray them. In fact, it might be better for us if God was not listening to something we pray. <laughs> when you're praying, do the prayers reflect that you're speaking to an all powerful God? Or do your prayers reflect the fact you're, you're praying to someone that's just a super big version of you? There's a difference. Everybody understand that? That makes sense. You can either pray to God or you can pray to a really big version of you. And for some of us, our concept of God is simply a big, big version of us. It's like God's like me. He's just bigger and stronger. And you do more stuff. Right? And that's why when you're limited, you think God's limited. But if God is God, and it's totally different than you, how would you pray differently? If you knew that nothing was impossible, right? If you began your day and really believed that nothing was impossible, you think you might be a little more excited? Or is it that we begin our day and we're like, I think one of the problems with my day is that when I begin my day, I don't think about limitless possibilities. I think about multiple obligations. In fact, the first thing that comes to my mind is probably all the limits I have on my day. Well, I can't do this because I have to do this. I can't do this today. Nope, don't got money for that today. We begin our day full of limitations. Right? I talked a couple weeks ago about the, 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 the the, 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 what was that insect that jumped around and stuff? The flea and the container. And we talk about this stuff, about taking the, the taking the lid off, etc. But if we're honest, we'll go right back to our days and live right inside that same container over and over and over again. But what if we really began our day believing that God could actually do the impossible? I did not say improbable. I did not say unlikely. I said impossible. Definition people, you know the difference. Right? Improbable, that's not likely to happen. Impossible, there is no way that can happen. What if you believe God to do things that were absolutely impossible? Would that bring an excitement to your day? Right? How you will wake up? Anybody? We ain't getting our hopes up like that. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so God could not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Right? But if you really began every day believing that God would do impossible things, how different your life would be. Impossible things. Impossible things. Right? And so I have friends, and I'm trying to be like some of them sometimes. They're actually like wake up and they're coming back with testimony saying, you know what? I'm so excited because I was believing God to, you know, take care of some financial situations I was having. And now I looked up and now all of a sudden my bill, I don't know who paid it. It's totally paid in full. 
Now, I like improbable stuff, right? That's my domain. It's like, and so we need God to touch somebody's heart, to cause me to, you know, to get like a promotion, a raise, a bonus. Improbable. But then there's impossible says, so you know what? No, it just, somebody just went into a system, somebody just like painted, it. Like, it's just paid. It's like, it's just paid. The whole thing, not like in little bit of pieces, not through better budgeting, like just totally paid. Yeah, totally paid. That's exciting to me. Question for you, do you want to live life in the realm of the improbable or the realm of the impossible? To what degree do you want to believe God? Because the only limit is the extent to which you're willing to believe. And if you're willing to have faith and believe God for big things, guess what? Big things will happen in your life. Right? But if you want to believe God for small things, you'll have that too. It's all about what you decide to spend your time believing. Right? And so I have to transition in my prayer right from my complaint list, which tends to look like this, right, in terms of believing God for small things, right? It's like, just take these complaints away, right? To actually believe in God for bigger things. Both says the worlds were framed by the words of God. And start actually, see, if you define yourself by limitations, this becomes, Lord, please just remove this lid from off of me so I can jump. Well, that's one frame of living. Once you take the lid off, now what you're going to do? I don't know how to talk about that. It's a really narrow version of life. What's my what, what, What's God doing? Well, I'm free. Great. Right. Anything after that? No. That's what we do in church. Right? We celebrate being free. But free to do what? Have you really created a vision for what the future looks like after freedom? And so another flea says, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm going to not only be out of the list, not only be gone, but I'm going to find myself a little girl flea. We're going to have like a whole lot of flea, big flea family. We're going to live on this wonderful, big, giant dog. No, better than that. A horse. No, better than that. A hippopotamus. They have fleas. But bigger than that, right? I'm going to have a woolly mammoth. Yes, yes, a woolly mammoth. And I'm going to live, you know, that's so exciting. And a whole vision. When you pray, do you say, God, just get the lid off? Or do you have a dream of a woolly mammy, mammy family of fleas? <laughs> All right. Do you have a vision that goes beyond simply solving your problem? But I think the issue is that all we see is our problems and we define our future in, the, in terms of the absence of problems. You can't have excitement life, exciting life, just trying to get your problem solved. And I blame this on our theology, right? Because we've, we've created this whole notion around Jesus can work it out. How you going to pay the rent? All your money spent. A little bit to buy some food. Maybe need a pair of shoes. And it's all about, so it's got a light bill too. You've got a gas bill too, right? And the whole notion is, oh, God, get me out of this. But after that, then what? We've got no plan for our lives. After we get this stuff, this our problem stuff. That's not purpose. That's just deliver. Why do we get where's purpose? Where's the plan? Where's the future? We've got to get connected to future and to promise and to destiny and to what God really wants me to do. And that's where excitement comes in. That we're standing, because my time must be up. But y'all were so nice, y'all didn't let me know. <laughs> we're standing. We're, we're, we're done. I hope this made sense today. I hope it did. I hope it really did. I hope that God will challenge you as he did to me. So when you wake up tomorrow and you start your day, God will ask you stuff like, what are you excited about today? Right, and you'll begin to be able to answer God affirmatively. You'll be able to talk to God about what you're excited about and really be really be excited about life. That makes sense to anybody. Makes sense to anybody. I, I think that we're living in an exciting time. I, I do believe that. Life is exciting for us. It's an exciting time to be alive. It's an exciting time. It's good to be on this side of the cross. And um, we, we've talked about it before, but certainly um, if you 
um, within yourself. Um, know that you need God in a more awesome way. I challenge you um, to join in to one of these um, reading sort of exercises. We're doing the book of Luke, the book of John, and just develop a steady appetite of the word of God. The more you read and submit yourself to the word of God, I'm telling you, the word has a way of doing something crazy in, in your life. It'll just be an amazing thing. And it will challenge you. It'll push you. It'll repel you um, forward. Um, as you know, if anybody's been baptized in Jesus' name, please consult with Our Lady Blackman. Um, and we'll make sure we get that arranged um, for you. For those that are still seeking the gifts of the Holy Ghost, we are praying with you. Amen. That God will grant it. I'll tell you like they used to tell me when I was a kid, you could be in your kitchen washing your dishes. Just saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost will just come upon you. Don't be around later. Khadija, when it happens, she will laugh at you. But, <laughs> but I'm telling you, it can happen at any time as long as you continue to keep the praise of God upon your lips. He tells us the Holy Ghost comes in on praise. And so just keep praising God. Just keep saying, God, God, I thank you. God, I love you. God, I glorify you. God, and as you continue to fill your heart with praise, and every time God shows you something about yourself, and I'm sure that he will. Um, that's not like him. Ask God to forgive you. Don't let that condemn you. Don't let that get you stuck. Don't let, don't always forget a place where you, you, you doing this, but just on Sunday, you're like, oh, I thought you loved God. I thought you were trying to repent. No, don't let the devil bring condemnation. Um, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, right? And so don't allow condemnation to get into your heart, but instead what you do is just say, Lord, forgive me and keep on living your life. And then start praising God over and over again. And as you keep praising God, I promise you the Holy Ghost comes in on praise. That makes sense to anybody. Next thing you know, you'll find yourself speaking in different languages too. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Make sure you let us know. <laughs> Amen. And it happens just like that. One day we should do us a, a, we should pause and give people an opportunity to share when they came through with the Holy Ghost, what the experience was like. We used to testify about that back in the old church and encourage some of the other saints so they would know. Um, how powerful it was and experience um, that it was for them. I remember I was there when Lady came through. I was there when she came through way back in 1990-something. <laughs> but we're preparing to dismiss asking our Lady Blood to come and give us our concluding prayer.